Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a minute to grab milk tea and a massage, and you're ready for round two this afternoon, where we're picking up our conversation, talking about the intersection of DPIN and AI. And that's really what today is focused on and all about. Um, you know, as we dive deeper into this world of AI, we're, it really feels like we're at this precipice, this inflection point. And it can go one of two ways, right? It can go into these deeper centralized models, or there's really an opportunity here to decentralize this tech. And here on this panel, we have an incredible group of people at different levels who are working with deep in projects and AI solutions who are creating this decentralized AI infrastructure. So, you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from these guys. So I'm going to kick it off. I want, to, I want everyone to go down the line, introduce themselves, talk about the team that you're with, what you're building, and how you're uh, integrating Filecoin into your tech stack. Yeah, happy to. My name is Angelie George. I'm the CMO and Head of Growth at Theoric. So at Theoric, we're building the foundational layer for AI agents. And our thesis is that the future is not one like, general purpose agent, but multi like agent workflows of specialized agents sort of working together, collaborating with each other. So we've been building for about two and a half years at this point. We came out of the Alliance DAO and Chainlink build programs. So our founding team are Web3 or Web2 AI experts who've been building AI solutions for like the last 15 years. Um, our CEO came out of like the MIT AI program and they really were, you know, he was most recently leading applied AI at Google Cloud and working at a centralized in institution that was really you know, driving AI growth and like building AI solutions, he realized that if we continue down this path, there's going to be a few megalithic corporations that control all of AI development across the stack from compute and chips to like agents. And so how do you bring in community ownership? How do you make sure that with AI becoming like the next revolutionary technology, how do we make sure that like the benefits are shared amongst the people? And so they decided to kind of employ blockchain guardrails and token incentives to be able to drive that. And so that's really what we've been doing. We came out of Testnet a few months ago and it's just been kind of massive growth ever since. And so we're really excited to be here. Cool. Alejandro, what about you? Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandro. I belong to the strategic initiative office from SingularityNet. SingularityNet was founded in 2017 by Dr. Ben Gortzel with the ambitious uh, vision of creating a decentralized, democratic, and beneficial artificial general intelligence. So as part of our roadmap, we created an AI marketplace that's the topic of the, of the panel, uh, where uh, the community can publish the AI services and commercialize them through our token. Now we are evolving and we are integrating Filecoin technology, so looking forward to this panel and dive deeper into this. Hi everyone, I'm Ayush. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Hurdle01. Hurdle is a people-powered communication network, essentially a decentralized communication infrastructure. That means if you are doing a audio and video kind of call, you don't require a centralized data center anymore. You can do that via your own laptop, your own Raspberry Pi, or your own devices. We've been building for four years now. Uh, we are a deep in project with a product-first approach. We have built an app very similar to Zoom which works in a completely decentralized manner, works better, works faster, is safer. And we have built the whole network itself. That means if we five are doing a call, and if Rachel has a good internet connection, uh, they can become a node and can power the call of all of us. Uh, it's been live, and we use Filecoin pretty actively. Like all the audio and video which gets recorded essentially gets stored over Filecoin in a decentralized manner, making sure that your calls are safe, your calls are sound, and essentially it, is, it can never be tampered with. Uh, we came out of essentially a Techion accelerator, which was backed by Filecoin back in the day. And yeah, it's been a long four-year ride, and Filecoin has been an integral part of it. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jaden. I chair Aether Foundation. Aether Network is essentially, you can think of us as like a trip.com, but for GPUs, uh, specifically enterprise grade. So we have the most number of enterprise-grade GPUs, H100s, uh, 4090s, A100s, across any other deep in stack. Uh, we do about 40 million in revenue annually, servicing large enterprises around the world. Uh, we have compute nodes available in 92 uh, countries around the world. And we specialize mostly in AI training, AI inference, well, hardware for AI training, AI inference, as well as cloud gaming, so some of the largest games in the world. Uh, do mobile cloud gaming and cloud phone technologies through our tech stack. Cool. So we, we have this great cross-section here, right? We have AI agents, we have decentralized compute, we have 
technologies built on the tech stack, marketplaces. So we're talking about deep in and AI. Are those, how do you feel about those words? Do you think they're complementary? Do you think they're like truly intersectional? Um, are these terms like on, from the marketing side of the house? Do you feel like it's overplayed? How do you think about these things? Yeah, so I think from our side, deep in and AI essentially makes a lot of sense. Uh, give an example of Huddle01. Uh, we have been uh, building into the bandwidth category because you require a lot of bandwidth uh, to essentially power an audio and video call. And if you are able to have a good amount of bandwidth, essentially you can do a lot of stuff in the AI space. So I, I think AI as a brain, and for that brain you require a lot of uh, nervous system, and for that nervous system, that's where the bandwidth and deepen uh, comes into picture. For example, if you use Chat GPT right now, uh, if you want to chat with the GPT, how we started with using GPT was using text. You used to ask a lot of questions, and now we are moving towards an audio way in which we are chatting with the GPT. In future, we'll do that in a video manner, and, and this will keep on increasing. So the way we communicate with these AI agents will keep on increasing over time. This is what we are seeing at Huddle One, for example, is that. Now, in, in a meeting room, there's an AI agent which acts as a therapist, which acts as a friend, and you can talk to that AI agent. Now, to do that in a real-time manner, you require a super low latency. For example, if you are in Bangkok right now, and if the servers are in, in North Virginia, you will not have a very good experience talking to an AI agent, and that's why you require the node to be in Bangkok itself to have a very good quality of call, and that's where we believe that deep in and AI makes a lot of sense together because the decentralized physical infrastructure networks brings it much closer. It's more like an Airbnb kind of model, which makes sure that the, the AI in which, the, the AI agent with which you are talking to has a very good experience. You are having a low latency, you're having a much lesser uh, problem in terms of communicating and all those things. So that's where we believe that that's how we're using it right now. Even if you use it right now in terms of Huddle One, you will see that you can have a agent talking to you and when you do that with a, with a JPT, you'll see a difference. You'll see that uh, the quality of call is much faster. It's much better. And I think that's where we require the uh, deep in infrastructures to make sure that AI is as efficient as it can be. Jaden, I, I want to bring you in here. Um, do you think about does decentralized AI, I mean, do you feel that you sacrifice speed, efficiency? Per, I mean, how do you think about that, that interplay? Yeah, so I think edge computing uh, or distributed CPU, GPU infrastructure is definitely one of the most core parts of uh, AI advancement. I think where AI is very interesting is as a tech stack compared to traditional tech stacks we've seen in you know, older Web2 days, right, with the internet boom and all of those things, is uh, AI is building much more quickly in a much more open source fashion. And I think crypto does have a contributing factor to that as well, where the world has seen that building and writing open source code can actually make you a ton of money too, yeah. right? And, and so that's been very interesting where developers from all around the world are self-studying, self-learning, and starting to build their own AI agents on top of this, you know, either semi-open stack from the large companies or this fully open source stack like Llama, right? Uh, and with that, that's where the demand or the need for uh, more distributed, more decentralized uh, com compute at the edge becomes a much stronger demand, and, and we've personally seen that, right? Um, tons of small startups, small companies are starting to come to us and ask for a couple chips at a time, as opposed to you know, the large enterprise deals where we have these multi-million dollar, multi-year deals, uh, and we're starting to expand the network to be able to cater to that, and that is something we believe in a lot. Um, a big part of Aether Network's thesis is, you know, this open source development is going to lead to eventually faster growth uh, than the monopolized, you know, data stack or tech stack that we've been seeing dominating Web2 over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. Angela, I want to I bring you in here. You were nodding along. That sounds like right up your alley. Yeah, I mean, I, I think AI and DPIN are a, a really good match, right? Like. AI is going to become more and more sophisticated. The models are going to get more and more complex. They're going to have, you know, it's going to need more computing. And so there's definitely a need for that, especially when we think of what we're building Etheric as like a, what we call like the top layer of the AI crypto stack. AI agent developers will need access to like competitive pricing when it comes to compute. Because right now we have quite a few agents that we're running and like computation is quite an expensive cost. Like inferencing is very expensive and now we're working with lots of 
players like Aether is one of the partners that we're working with um, and speaking to, Hyperbolic, and a couple of others. And so how can you make credits available, right? And because a lot of these deepened providers are actually buying excess compute at b major data centers um, that are not being used, and so you can actually provide competitive pricing. But that being said, um, there is like a struggle when you're trying to integrate deep in with AI, and it's like a, an issue that we're still solving for. Um, while there is value, like using a centralized compute solution is much faster and more like proven. Um, and so like how do you convince a developer to choose the harder solution uh, when, even though like cheaper costs might be one, but like integrating is like one of the struggles that we're facing. And so that's like a contrarian approach, right? Because like, yes, there is value, but it's not mature enough um, as like the centralized solution. So that's like a, a, a give and take that you have. Yeah. I, I love this perspective. As a fellow marketer, I think about this all the time. How do you convince people, not your early adopters, but like the next group of folks? Like how do you, it's a little harder, but trust me, like the benefits are there, the long-term vision. So um, I appreciate that we're fighting that battle together. Um, Alejandro, I know that um, you're thinking a lot at SingularityNet about um, your strategy for pushing out decentralized marketplaces. So tell us, tell us about your new strategy. Yeah, absolutely. So as part of our mission, we started creating an AI marketplace where the community can publish the services and monetize them through our token, right? So now we just announced the ASI Create that is gonna be an AI launchpad that will allow the community to pass through all the different steps, so since the funding to the development, deployment, and also commercializing those AI agents. So we are providing all the dev tooling to ease that onboarding to the community to build on us. We are providing pre-trained customized AI agents that okay, they can modify, uh, they can automate in a very easy way. Uh, all of that will work with knowledge graphs, so the user, once they get an answer, they will be able to get the data provenance of the different knowledge assets that were uh, used for, for giving that particular answer. Um, we will allow the community also, thanks to our uh, member of the ASI Alliance Ocean Protocol, to trade with the data so they can buy and sell data. So we are combining all the different layers, since that the data storage that we are integrating already with you guys, with Filecoin, and also moving to the decentralized computing power. So as part of our ecosystem, we have a unit and hypercycle providing the decentralized computing power. And uh, now, uh, as part of our ASI Alliance, we have Kudos also supporting on that and providing the decentralized uh, computing. So just also, uh, we were mentioning about the community, and we just released the, the, the grant program, of a part of our grant program in deep funding over $1 million for uh, the community to uh, participates in, in the research and development of beneficial AGI, that is uh, our mission. So I think that that combination of the different elements, right, so decentralized storage and computing power, even energy efficiency through the AI agents, all that together will provide like a, a holistic view of, of the AI and what we consider a decentralized AI, because at the end, as they were saying, they are truly complementary technologies, AI and deep in, they need each other. And we are, we are very aware of that. Cool. OK, so in a few minutes, I want to start talking about some of the real world applications of the technologies that you all are working with. Um, but before that, let's take a step back. And, and I, I wouldn't be the true marketer that I am if I didn't say, why Filecoin? Like, why did you all choose to build with Filecoin? What advantages do you see that it has for your products, projects? And, and how can the folks in this room, who are really the builders, uh, help you make your projects a reality. Yeah, I think I think for us, why Filecoin? It was back in the day, like four years, July 2020, ETH Global HackFS. That's where it all started. And the whole idea was pretty simple. At the time when we were building uh, Huddle01, it was peak COVID. At that time, uh, people were using, uh, and Zoom essentially was skyrocketing as, as a stock uh, at $450. A lot of people started to use Zoom, but Zoom was not easy, uh, not ready infrastructure-wise to be used um, at a lot of places, essentially in APAC region where the servers were not there. And a lot of people had to use Zoom in tandem with something like WhatsApp or Telegram because the latency was so high, they had to ask the other people that, hey, what did that other person say? 
And that's where we started building Huddle One because we realized that the communication infrastructure is completely broken. It's in shambles right now and it only works really well if the data center is near you. The second problem which we saw was that recordings were supremely expensive. If you had to store anything over GCP, over Azure, over AWS, it was extremely expensive and you had to store it in a cold storage to make sure that it works uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a decent manner. And that's where we realized that if we need to solve this problem of communication as well as the storage of it, we need something which is, which is much more robust and which, is much more, which can actually stay without being tampered with. And that's where Filecoin and IPFS came into picture. So as soon as we built this infrastructure out of communication, we built our own app and that's where we saw that we can just store all of these things rather than on a hot storage of AWS over IPFS and the cold storage over Filecoin. So the option if you go on to Huddle01 right now, you'll see that if you record a call, you can record it over IPFS on a hot storage and you can store that over Filecoin as a cold storage. If you want to retrieve that back, it becomes very easy. Now this becomes very important for a lot of use cases. Number one is education. In education, you need to record all of these different calls for the purpose of a lot of compliances, copper laws and a lot of other things because if you're te teaching to your children, you require to record all of these calls, that's number one. Second, if you're talking to a doctor, uh, it's a doctor-patient confidentiality agreement, you require HIPAA compliance and that's where you require, you require these kind of calls to be stored in a very encrypted manner and Filecoin could be trusted with that because again, it's building in an open manner completely and these kind of use cases made a lot of sense for us that okay, if you need to solve this problem of communication, Recording becomes such an important part. Storage becomes such an important part of it. And that's where we started building it. People started loving it. We right now power a lot of education-based clients, and a lot of them use IPFS and Filecoin as a storage option for us. And I think it's just the start. Uh, as we start moving towards this different kind of robotics and IoT-based environments, recording sizes will keep on increasing. Storage size will keep on increasing. That's where Filecoin makes a lot of sense for us, and that's why we choose Filecoin. Yeah. Uh, for, for us, it's pretty straightforward. Um, when it comes to decentralized hardware, Falcoin is the best in the game, by far. Say, say um, that like three more times. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll expand on it, right? So the, when it, the ecosystem that you guys have built around bridging hardware, which is a very unsexy Web2 traditional business, uh, Web2 financing, which is an even more boring business than hardware, uh, into crypto, into something that's very, very exciting. and all the little bits and pieces and tools and partners and, 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 and infrastructure that you actually have to get into place to bring it all together is something that's incredibly difficult to do. Falcoin knocked it out of the park. The, you guys have been knocking it out of the park. And being able to be a part of that and, and see the way that you guys do it and learn from that is incredible for us. Um, I think that's one on a business angle. And then on a technical angle, of course, uh, we do rendering, right? Infer inferencing and rendering. Uh, storage is a big component of that, right? So on the technical level, there's also still, um, I think down the line, a lot of different ways that we can end up integrating networks and working together as well. So, yeah, so from our side, I, I really resonate with all the, the things that I'm listening. Um, we started using IPFS and we just announced our partnership like very recently between Singularity and Filecoin, it was last, last summer. And we, last week, accomplished the first phase of the technical integration. So uh, three of the main components of our marketplace, like CLI, Demon, and Python SDK, are using Filecoin storage thanks to Lighthouse SDK. It was uh, so easy, so simple, so becoming more resilient technology. So this, uh, we will continue working on that uh, during the next uh, months So uh, to integrate uh, the full technology stack that we have, we will add the paper use, and yeah, as of now, the, the community can directly get the subscription from Filecon and then get the API key and provide that to our CLI to start a, a storing the, the metadata files in, in Filecon storage. So happy to be here, happy to continue exploring uh, more avenues of collaboration. Yeah, um, for our end, really like one of the big reasons working with Filecoin was really exciting was the, the vast amount of data that's being stored on Filecoin already, right? And so Filecoin's already made quite a lot of 
high profile introductions to us, especially like teams like Open Panda and Muckrock, where they're storing like open source data sets on Filecoin. And so this is really exciting because when you think about making data accessible to people, and like we really believe that AI is going to be that like technology that, especially in the very, very short term, it's about analyzing and understanding data. As much as we're all excited about sentient agents launching their own tokens, um, I think like the first use case is really going to be like data understanding, right? And so we want to make that data available to developers as they come in. So if they want to make agents that can, you know, analyze cancer data and cancer research that's available through Open Panda, or they want to look into like historical like release CIA files, which Muckrock worked on, um, that's another like, area that we're working on as well, right? And then the easiest, simplest integration is understand Filecoin and how do you set up a miner and how do you work through that process? And you know, those are like easy like access points. And then longer term, logs from agents need to be stored somewhere that is like encrypted, that is safe. Um, so those are all areas that we're exploring with Filecoin at the moment. Cool. So I want to stick with this topic of, of data and data and integration. Um, how, uh, Anjali, how do you see the relationship between data quality and decentralization? Um, like, does spreading data across many nodes help with AI? Like, what do you think about that? Like, what is the benefit? Does it hurt AI training to have it across many nodes, or does it help? Yeah, so we're not really focused on training. Okay. Um, our main focus is really around like enabling agents to access. So having a single data point, like access point does make it easier like for an agent to do RAG and things like that. Um, however, and when you're thinking about safety of data and how like it's sharded and like sa saved across multiple nodes, um, it makes it easier for like for like the encryption standpoint of things, um, but from like how easy is it to build an agent that uses like distributed data, it's actually much harder. Uh, but from like providers like Filecoin, it does make it easier because of the way that like Filecoin integration works, um, regardless of the fact that it is sharded and kept across multiple nodes, we are able to access that fairly simply and straightforward. And so that actually is like an unlock with working with players like Filecoin. Cool. Um, all right, my favorite thing to talk about real world applications. Because when I'm trying to explain to people outside of our ecosystem what I do, they give me like a glazed look and their head cocks to the side if I say decentralized storage. But if I say, listen, like anything on today's web that requires like massive amounts of backend storage, you can build in web three. And like the huddle is one of my great examples, right? Cause like, oh, you use Zoom? Like think about the massive quantities of data you're creating, you wanna preserve. There are web three alternatives. Um, and I know, Ayush, you talked about the benefits for education, um, but I'd love to hear from the rest of this uh, panel, sort of what do you think are the biggest and best real world use cases for the technologies you're working with? Okay, I'll start. So, so we do actually have um, four main use cases in our stack. Uh, the first is cloud gaming, which is essentially the ability to play any video game that's hosted on our cloud uh, on any device simply through a link, right? So you could play, for example, League of Legends uh, on your mobile phone. I mean, you, the mobile version exists now, but you could play the PC version on your phone uh, simply by clicking through a link. Uh, the second is Cloud Phone, which is a similar idea, but essentially you could host uh, an instance of a phone with a SIM card uh, without needing to have a phone that's very high capacity, right? So for example, if I wanted to do trading, um, across four or five different devices, but I don't want to buy four or five iPhones. I can buy four or five cheaper phones, but I can host an iPhone instance or an iPhone level capability instance phone uh, on, across these devices for a much cheaper cost. It probably costs you two to three dollars a month, uh, and you'd be able to get the same hardware level performance through the cloud. Um, the last two uh, beyond that are edge computing, which we've spoken a lot about, right? Uh, bringing compute AI inference closer to the user so that the inferencing happens faster. And then finally is uh, AI training, which is you know, every deep in project. Uh, it's cheaper to use decentralized deep in for training. Anybody else? How do you explain your, what you do to your mom? Is that like a question that you get? And how do you talk about these technologies to audiences outside of this room? Yeah, I mean, we really do believe that AI is going to be a transformational technology, right? And like with models getting more and more complex, the 
whatever you can do with an AI is just gonna get more sophisticated. And so what we're trying to enable is like, how do you get lots of developers to be able to contribute? Because right now the way AI development is happening, even if you're thinking about like multi-agent workflows, it's one developer that's building multiple agents that are hard coded to work together. But the problem that we're trying to solve is if everybody on this panel today contributed an agent that like independently could build a game five project. Let's use that as an example, right? Like you've got a marketer, you've got a copywriter, you've got a designer, you've got a coder, you've got a role designer. Now all of us have skill sets. How do you get all of them to sort of communicate, like, you know, pass along their uh, solution to each other so that they can build together? And then there's like payments for the end user, whoever puts in that like prompt to ask for it. So that's what we're building. Like we're building the channels to pay like for each of these agents to talk to each other. And for the end user to only make one payment and then our protocol decides how do you split this amongst everybody because of each person's contribution. So we've proofs built around that. How do you verify that this agent actually does the work that it says it does? Um, so it's just like thinking about a human team that you're trying to build for a company. Eventually you're gonna have like one person billion dollar companies, right? Like you have one person with a brilliant idea that's able to employ a swarm of agents that's able to do the task for them. And what we're building is basically the infrastructure layer that allows you to find these agents without you knowing which agent to pick, which is an even bigger problem because if there's 30 different copywriting agents, how do you know the right person for your GameFi project is gonna get picked? And so, like, trying to abstract away that complexity is what we're working on. And, you know, I, I would call it a big experiment because we're all sort of solving small pieces of this puzzle so that in 10 years, this is like a reality that we see because you can't say that it's gonna happen in six months, right? And it's like baby steps towards that process. And so we're sort of proving out pieces of that puzzle as we go along. Do you guys use AI to decide which AIs to use? Yes. Ooh. Yeah. AI so we have like a, a router and like a, an optimizer that understands. So they're all agents that talk to other agents. And eventually the goal is that if there is an agent that you need that it doesn't exist in the platform, that the agent will actually be able to contract another agent to build the agent that you need. So you're gonna get to this future where agents will build themselves like utility that they need and you're, you're already seeing that, right? Like Truth Terminal and like a whole bunch of other projects, they're talking about it. And how much of that is reality? We all have to say it like sit and see, like we're talking to teams that are working on TEE and things like that for that problem, but it's a very interesting like area to be in right now. Yeah, we in Singularity are building a, a programming language that is called Meta, that it will be, available, will be able to rewrite itself while, while performing the computation over the knowledge graph. So yeah, looking forward to that as well, yeah. yeah. I, I think there is a pretty interesting um, friend.com, if you had heard of it, there was a locket, like, P, uh, like this one of the person called Avi, I think he, he's the founder of it, he uh, just created that subdomain and Essentially, you cannot talk to that friend. It's like that Black Mirror episode where you can just talk to it and uh, you can ask any kind of questions. It's a friend of yours. Now, that's where we actually pinged him. It's like, hey, Evie, actually, do you think that when you talk to that, that locket of yours, will it respond in real time? I think that's very required. When you're talking to an agent, a human to AI interaction or an agent to an agent interaction, you require it to be in a latency of less than 100 milliseconds for, for the call to actually be a real time for you to experience that. I think that's the infrastructure which we are building, giving it to these different kind of apps where you can interact with these AI agents in a very efficient fashion without feeling it to have a latency of five seconds so that you cannot collaborate well with it. So yeah, I think that's how I explained to my mom as well that, hey, mom, in future you'll be having to talk to an agent and let's suppose if I'm not there, if you talk to some an agent of mine, right. how will that work like in a, in a real time fashion? I think that's what we built in our own app as well, but yeah, it's very interesting times and I'm pretty excited to see what we take out of it. Uh, the idea of AI agents talking to AI agents, I feel like the little emoji with the head exploding, like, <laughs> uh, Okay, so we've got a minute left. Um, we sort of, you all gave us sort of a peek of what you think the next three to five years looks like, but I would love if you, let's leave here with the challenge to the audience of like, what is the one thing that you think, we, each of you thinks we need to overcome to make this a, a reality? What's the biggest challenge standing in our way? I think we need like, I always talk about this, but you know how we have laws of robotics? I think we need laws of AI before 
a lot of people dare to dream bigger because a lot of great engineers today, they don't have a good way to frame like what an AI really, what's the end potential versus what's the baseline, right? So that's what I spend a lot of time thinking about in the shower. I actually tend to agree with that. I, I think the biggest limiting capa uh, like problem right now is our creativity. Um, you know, I've been talking to a lot of AI like developers recently, and especially in Web three, right? Like we feel so constrained by what we think that our users need that we're only building that. Because I've spoken to so many Web three AI projects right now that are like, oh, we care about agents swapping things and buying things on chain, and like. That's like the big goal right now. And I think that's what I mean. Like, like our creativity is what's limiting us. And like once we start imagining like what the future possibility is, you were talking about like uh, an AI therapist and it's actually being studied in Canada's Vector Institute right now, how people actually do much better if you have a version of yourself talking back to you about like how to solve your problem, right? You're more likely to listen to yourself than to somebody else. And like now you still have HIPAA laws and things like that when it comes to agents using that, but it's still like the next thing that you're gonna see, right? And then what comes after that? So we're only limited by like the extent of our imagination and I think that's gonna be the biggest unlock for us. Well, thanks. Thank you, panelists. This was wonderful. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, you led us perfectly into our next panel, which we're talking about healthcare, the interplay of healthcare and, and Web3. So thanks to everybody up here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.